the VAR show the one place for your weekly football update Hola a very warm welcome to the VAR show the show which talks about all the various major football leagues in detail today we are going to continue the theme of interviews and we have a very influential figure in the asian footballing culture and also he was a very very instrumental player in the indian footballing culture as a manager few years back and also we hope he comes back into the asian footballing culture as soon as possible we have the former manager of pune fc and he was also the manager of warriors in singapore mr karim ben sharifa for those who do not know pune football club is an asian club based in pune maharashtra in india so the club pulled out of i i league early, early in 2015 16 season that's a very sad news to hear any club pulling out of the i league or any league for that matter the main club shut down its operation while pune fc academy was acquired by isl club fc pune city so you all might be familiar with fc pune city so as for mr karim ben sharifa he is a former moroccan football player and currently a head coach for many clubs he has been a head coach so mr karim has been a head coach in around five countries can you imagine five different countries which included his home nation morocco as well as clubs in malta brunei singapore and india he has won the i league in 2010-11 season with salgosa and the federation cup in 2011 with the same team so without wasting much time i would like to thank mr karim for coming on the show first and foremost like he's a very very busy man he has been giving webinars after webinars so you can understand the st- the stature he has and it's a it was very difficult for him to take out time but i would thank you again once again for taking up ta- time and coming to the show so thank you and welcome to the show first i would like to ask you how are you and what are you doing during this pandemic period well, first of all i would like to thank you for inviting me to your show uh, i hope all the 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 people who will listen to it uh, will have a good time uh, yes um, we are uh, as the world um, uh, trying to deal with this uh, pandemic is covid-19 um, i think uh, morocco i'm right now in morocco we are in confinement this is the fifth or sixth week and still going uh, i think the the country took uh, good steps in the right times uh, closing quickly the borders and uh, uh, closing all uh, uh, daily life com- com- uh, commerce and the only the the doctors the hospitals the pharmacies and the supermarkets are open and uh, they advise people to mainly stay home to stay safe and i think uh, uh in in a big way people are abiding with that and uh, which uh, hopefully we can see the the light of uh, coming out from this uh, disease okay now we'll move on to a lighter topic that is football so you have been in you have been a uh, coach of many clubs in many different countries from morocco to malta to brunei singapore india a lot of countries like so how how is the football culture in india compared to maybe some other places you have been to well first of all uh, despite the the pandemic uh, we are still in football this is one of the examples our interview but i'm very um, active in uh, doing many uh, or participating in many webinars in fact i was uh, a guest speaker in uh, karnataka state coaches under the uh, the coaches uh, association uh, of india uh, i'm also part of uh, a daily uh, webinars with the, um, uh, an organization in morocco which assembled a platform of uh, coaches uh, psychologists uh, fitness trainers basically most of the jobs that are around uh, football <coughs> uh, 
to answer your question is is very difficult. Um, but I was uh, lucky enough to to coach in uh, in basically six different uh, countries uh, all over the world. Uh, which, if you notice, though that some of them are not big footballing countries, but I had the the chance to coach in four continents. Uh, uh, also, thanks to football, uh, basically going doing mainly coaching courses or playing games like uh, AFC games and uh, uh, African uh, <coughs> competitions. I had been in not less than about forty countries. But uh, India had a big impact in my career, in my life, in my personal life. Uh, India is, uh, is, uh, is a country that uh, I have spent uh, almost nine years. And uh, it's not that, uh, that uh, the clubs didn't want me anymore. In fact, it's myself who had to leave, uh, to resign from Pune and leave for personal uh, problems. Uh, I still hold a lot of uh, uh, great contact and touch with uh, with many coaches, with many officials, and many people who are involved in the game. There, uh, I came in a time where, as you know, there was uh, the start of the I League, the end of NFN National Football League, and the start of the I League with new sponsors. New, and I think the I League did did its job uh, by raising the game in a, in a good le- in a good level uh, also there was uh, uh, a lot of sponsors uh, but uh, you you feel like uh, during the i league time uh, you feel that uh, we still need to go to the next level and i think isl took over from then and uh, and uh, succeed in a way to bring the game in another level by drawing more fans by making the game more visible, more uh, uh, commercial, uh, and marketing, and uh, and uh, and uh, the the things that I can say about uh, about India is that if I talk about the players that are very dedicated, easy to work with, uh, they want to progress, they want to uh, get better, and of course this uh, helped me a lot compared to some other places where I have coached, which could be a little bit maybe more uh, more uh, difficult because some sometimes the players can be, uh, you know, lazy, can be uh, not motivated enough, uh, w- which uh, wasn't the case in, in India. So, uh, we'll go back to your one particular club. You have won a countless amount of trophies, but I would like to ask you, how did it feel winning the I-League with Salgosar in 2010-11? I think that would be one of the most, uh, one of your most cherished moments in Indian football. Your with your time there. Absolutely. I mean, every good moment, every trophy I had won there, uh, it's it's just amazing. But of course, Salgosar was a very, very unique uh, achievements in the sense that uh, we have to know that. Uh, uh, before I joined, uh, Salgokar was uh, finding it difficult to, to find the stability in in, uh, in the in uh, the I League itself. You know, they in, I think in the years before they had relegated the more than once. And the the the, the thing is that when I joined Salgokar at half, uh, they had the first round of the I League that year with uh, an American coach, if I remember well. And then I came to the second half. The first half was uh, very difficult. They were second from bottom. And my objective with the chairman was that we save the club from relegation. It was a, a quite average group of players, but uh, players who, who would like to learn. <clears throat> we, uh, so we start working in, uh, in a good way. And the, 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 everybody understands that we have really to pull our socks and uh, uh, punch above our weight to, to, to achieve that difficult task to, to, to avoid relegation. Uh, and slowly, the more we, we had work, because at Salgokar, to be honest, there is conditions of work. We had a good feed, we had a, a chairman who, who is available, who take care of everything, and slowly, 
the, the, the hard work uh, start paying off. And in fact, we finished that season. The, if you count only the second round results, we was the second best team after them for the champion. And we didn't only save relegation, but we end up top half of the league. We end up in the sixth position, which was really amazing. Just to give you an idea, because I left Mohan Bagan in the first round, uh, I think I left them third position. Uh, at the end of the season, Salgaukar was sixth, uh, just behind Mohan Bagan fifth. And, and actually, I was joking with uh, that time with uh, Mr. Debashish Datta, the, one of the top officials of Mohan Bagan, on the phone. And I told him, God, I, I just needed two games to to go above my ex club, you know, uh, if, uh, if there. So then uh, we did uh, the, the club, the motivation around the club. Everybody was excited and we wanted to do something even bigger. So we start uh, building a quite strong team. We got some good players in, uh, Sweka, Yakubu, uh, uh, some of the foreigners, Luciano, who I found there, this Brazilian center back, was uh, the captain and the leader of the team. So we we built a team uh, in two criteria. One, we needed good players, but two, we needed also good human beings, you know, good good people. And we, uh, that group, uh, I was just talking about it in, in a webinar yesterday, when we talk about... Uh, the education that we need to educate players. It's not only training that matter, but also educating the players. So the preseason of the following year, which which all the success comes, uh, first we build a good team, and second we we had one of the best uh, preseasons uh, because usually when you do preseason before the start of the season, uh, you you think of improving the fitness the tactics, the technique of the players. But actually, because since we was in a hotel for a long time, and we uh, basically you cannot train every day, morning and afternoon, we, 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 we scheduled, uh, we had work on the field, but uh, every two, three days, we brought uh, somebody to educate our players. For example, we brought uh, a person called Kaizad, one of the a uh, nutritionist very well known from Mumbai who talk, uh, made a presentation to the players and talked to them about, uh, about nutrition, about uh, uh, a healthy style of life for a football professional player. He talked to them also about uh, the, the importance of being careful with the, with the doping product because the risk was suspension of two years, I think. So we, we educate them in this field. Uh, with this guy for one good session with questions, with taking notes. So we get the players into a classroom, uh, learning this uh, component of the game. Uh, we also brought a few days later a psychologist, one lady that talked to them about the imagery, uh, what to do in the dressing room and the day before the game uh, to achieve a performance, you know, to imagine the game, uh, exercise of breathing, uh, how to avoid stress. Uh, we brought uh, a referee, a retired referee, Mr. Benjamin from Goa, who uh, educate the players about how the, the, the referees see also the game and how you have to be careful in, uh, in being uh, what you need to avoid, to not get into stupid cards, stupid arguments. So uh, not only educating them the rule of the game and the new rules of the game, but also in terms of behavior and attitude. So we did a lot of things in that camp and it was a solid base for our season uh, but yet was that was not enough because the story of that season regarding the i league is that we was always fourth fifth third so nobody uh, put us as a league winner there was east bengal who from the start took a big start of the league there was dempo as always there there was other teams but never Salgokar was just in the mix and uh, there was this key game, the game who turned everything around was against East Bengal in Goa and I think it was that time third and I think if I'm not wrong, 
this was around the end of the season, still only three or four games to go. I think already East Bengal, if they had won uh, that game against us, they would have either won the league or big step to to the to win in the league already. Uh, first half, first 20 minutes was uh, uh, East Bengal told Geosbe their striker scored two goals, quick goals. So in our home ground, we was 20 minutes down to 2-0. And uh, halftime, one of the things I did, uh, which I did it rarely, is two substitutions and both on the right side. I took off the, because that's where the goals came from, took off the right back and the right half. And we put uh, new new players. And then second half, it was completely new team. We dominated the game and Jakubu had scored the winner uh, around the end of the game, 3-2. And that's basically was a pick uh, because that was a six-pointer. Because we, we won three points, but we took away three points from East Mangal and we got closer until the last uh, game of the Ali, which we played in JCT uh, in Ludiana, away game. And still nothing was clear about the league, who is winning the league, because we had to win the game because there was us, East Bengal and Dempo in the last round that could anyone could win it. For us, if we win the game, we win the league despite any results. Uh, but if we draw and uh, Dempo win with a big margin, they win the game. The other part of it is that JCT in Ludhiana, if they lose the game, they relegate. For them to save relegation, they had to beat us. So you see the toughness of, of this game. You know, it was do or die game for them and for us. Uh, it was like the uh, Manchester City game, which they won the Aguero goal against QPR. Yes. It was similar yeah. to that. So this this game was huge game. And we, we finally uh, won, the, won the game, uh, I think 2-1 or 2-0. And we won the league. And immediately after, the, later on, I think uh, at, the end, at the start of the new season, there was the Federation Cup uh, with Salgokar as well. We had a good campaign and the final of the Cup uh, again was against East Bengal in Calcutta. Can you imagine that? 70,000 people, all fans of East Bengal. We felt so lonely on that uh, Salt Lake uh, Stadium. Uh, you know, when you are you, me, the staff and the Salgaukar players, about uh, plus the officials, around 30 people in the middle of a stadium of 70,000 against you. So you can imagine the the situation. But we, I did prepare the players mentally, the whole uh, uh, preparation for this game coming in. We did also something, uh, uh, a choice that because we, when you play against East Bengal in Calcutta, final of a cup, you know that this crowd will push and will drive their team. So I know that the first half, there will be, the, it's difficult to attack. Uh, basically, we had our strategy that the first half we soak the pressure of East Bengal. We stay steady, we defend well, even if we don't score, even if we don't create. And uh, for that, I explained to one of our key players one of our best players who starts all the time, Ruji Sweka, the Japanese uh, striker. And uh, that player, of course, everybody expects that he's a starter player. But I had a meeting with him and I said, if you play the first half, you will only waste your energy. And your strength is speed and skills. You're going to be very useful on the second half when we start coming up to attack. And that's what we did. They were surprised because how come Sweka is not playing, is he injured or not? But second half, I think, not even at halftime, later, uh, I think in the last 30 minutes, Sweka came in, changed the game. Because East Bengal had to keep attacking. There was a lot of space, tired defense, and you have a player who is speedy and very influential. Uh, he destroyed that, uh, that defense. We won 3-1 the final to win the cup. So that's the, that season, we was the... The, the really the, the I was discussing a few days ago with a fan of Isfanda and he told me you break our heart many times <laughs> basically because uh, whether with Salgaukar especially that year we took away from them the 
the, the, the league till last minute and also the final of the cup, we took it away from them. So it was an amazing moment. So you have coached in so many places and countries which are like uh, in terms of football may have better infrastructure. So how was the condition of footballing infrastructure, maybe the fields, changing rooms during your time in India, maybe clubs? Depend where you are. I mean, uh, in my time, you you have uh, stadiums like Pune. Uh, Pune Stadium was uh, was very very good. Uh, uh, in Goa, uh, it was it was okay. Uh, Salt Lake was huge, of course. But look, I, I, there are there are as a coach, I know that foreign coaches in general, many of them didn't succeed or survive in India. And I think one of the reasons is this, is that you cannot come, uh, in French we say l'intelligence, l'adaptation, c'est l'intelligence de l'homme, which means adaptation is the intelligence of human. I cannot come from a place and I expect everything to be like what I'm used to. You know, that is a comfort zone. You need to get out of your comfort zone. I had a belief and trust uh, during my career, till now, things that I can change, I will do everything to change it. Things that are under my control, things that I cannot change, I will not even waste my energy to even talk about it. You know, uh, if we're going to train in a bad field or a bad artificial pitch, uh, I'm not the governor of that place. I'm not a minister to have the power. I'm not an investor to come and say, okay, I'm going to close this field for one week. I'm going to change uh, and make a better surface. That's what is available. So if we keep lamented about the field or about the infrastructure, uh, because the games are won here, mental, uh, of course, we will not get the results. So I was always, in fact, I pushed this to a certain limit that the players, all the players that I had coached, they know about the the body language, you know, when I come to a training session, because usually you come to a stadium, which the dressing room, for example, is not up to the mark. The field is artificial pitch, all generation, hard. The weather is 42 degrees, very hot. So when I came to train there before the game, usually I always make a stop and I don't care about training because I'm here. I came early before the players. We set up everything, the technical staff. Then I'm sitting on the bench or something and I'm watching the players, their body language. You know, some, some are, you know, they're not coming very motivated and excited like if you're going to play in a nice carpet, grass field, uh, uh, bright infrastructure. Usually they will come, maybe not all, but majority they will come with different negative body language. Some of them even talk about it. So I'm on the bench and some players are a few meters away, changing, and one is going to say, oh my God, it's so hot. Uh, or another one will say, oh my God, look at that field. I mean, we may get injured in that field. And then I note all that. And usually when I go to these kind of situations, I made a longer meeting before the practice. Because the practice is not important anymore. The tactic, the technique is not important. Because you can do the best practice, one hour, 30 minutes. It's not useful because of the mindset of the players. So usually I would, I would take time enough to have a long discussion. It takes 20 minutes, 25, no problem. Even if we cut it short in the practice, and we're going to do only one hour, 15 minutes practice, but at least it's quality practice. So usually when I talk about this, I, I, I talk about this, uh, the few things that I notice and about the body language. And I always say to the players, how can you beat the opponent tomorrow if you already lost against the weather, you are losing 10-0. Against the, the field, you are losing 5-0. So to win your opponent, you need to score 16 goals. It's not possible. So, and then slowly we became like we, you have, you know, when you work in, a, in this um, 
uh, atmosphere of football, you, you need to be a warrior. It's not only a football player. You need to be ready. Is it snowing? Is it raining? Is it hot? Is it cold? Doesn't matter. It's here where you have to go to focus and, and go for the objective. The objective is not to, to, uh, to feel always comfortable in the comfort zone. The objective is to win tomorrow's game. So what we need to win, we need to do it. Do you want to win? Okay, yes, we want to win. But that's not the body language of a winning attitude. And when I do, usually when I do one, two meeting in that season, uh, of course, sometimes they forget and we walk the same way. And it need me only to say, while I'm sitting in a joking way, hey, body language, and then you're going to find the checks and walking properly and warming up properly. Sometimes you don't see sign of it before the practice, but sometimes you, you feel that everything is okay. And then you start the warm up. And usually my warm up, I give three, five minutes. So three, five, the first five minutes, you, especially when we go to a new field, away game or something, I ask the players to jog everywhere in the pitch, check the pitch, see the corners, see the, the 218 area, see the middle, is it uh, all good, is it this area is, is different and I have to be careful from it, uh, when I pass I have to be careful that it's bouncy here, so that's five minutes, if I, sometimes you, the, the entrance of the practice is good, but then when you start the warm up and during that five minutes I observe, you, you notice the body language of some players in the way they jog, in the way they are warming up, uh, is not good enough. So sometimes I will uh, raise my voice and give some instruction regarding this, or sometimes I would whistle, come in, guys, that's not the right attitude. It's not proper. We have, we cannot do a good practice and win tomorrow's game. With this. And then after, when you pass the right messages, uh, you you find a different, uh, a good reaction in general. So uh, now I'll talk about more about the league. So you have previously coached Mohan Bagan. Mm -hmm. So now you know, like the household names like Mohan Bagan are basically they're jumping into the ISL. Basically, they merged. They have merged with ATK. Do you think this mm -hmm. will hamper the publicity of the I-League? Like when you well, have a big team, it's like, you know, like Manchester United is leaving or maybe you can take Celtic in Scotland leaving uh, uh, Scottish League and going to the English League. It will hamper the Scottish League. No, but it's not, uh, it's not, uh, it's different. Uh, uh, it's not like Scottish team is going to an English League. This is the the, the same country league. It's like you say, uh, Pors Portsmouth uh, with Nottingham Forest, they assemble together to get strong team to play in the first division. So it's... it's, no, no. it's teams As a, from... Because uh, both the leagues are fighting for the topmost to be uh, like, the, the uh, top league in India. Do, do you think it will hamper the I-League? For me, it's not... What is important is not the name. Is it ISL? Is it I League? Is it? It's Indian football, which is important. It's national team of India, which is important. Uh, of course, uh, if you talk with heart, uh, you you find the I League was there for ten years, and you feel weak because you love this league and all that. But but uh, life teach me that the right decisions are taken not by the heart but by the by the logic and the brain uh, and the, and the india need one league of course this system of having two leagues both of them and short each league four months or five months it's not a good system you need one strong league which is from june till uh, uh, june or july they start pre-season and it goes till the last game is played around the uh, around the end of July, uh, around the June, okay, with one or two months break between one and two months break in the season. That's the right things to do. Now 
it seems that ISL became that's what they 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 are doing. ISL is top division, I League is second division. It's I think it's fine, you know, and it, it, it's it it's like everywhere. It's uh, it's competition. It's competition. The train. What do you prefer? Having a slow train with a lot of people hanging, and even if you are late, you can stop, have a coffee, and after run and catch the train or you want to uh, uh, like a japanese train you know fast train so when you have a fast train you need to wake up early and work to catch it because if you miss it uh, hey, it's your it's your mistake so it's it's i feel that the i league should catch up by structuring the clubs infrastructure marketing and and uh, and getting the funds, the sponsors, and uh, and getting into the, the the bigger the bigger league. There's no harm on that. It's a competition. And it's good competition. But the most important is that you have a lot of players playing the game, and you have a strong youth development following up, and you have a, a calendar, a proper calendar where the players are competitive for at least ten months. That's the right thing to do. So you also briefly coached in Warriors FC in Singapore, mm -hmm. which is one of the most successful teams in the country. So when you look back, do you think maybe if things would have been different, maybe uh, you would have much more success with the team? Like maybe with whatever condition you left the team, maybe if you could spend more time with the team, maybe you would be more successful with the team. When I when I left, uh, as I said, I left India for some personal problems. So my priorities changed a bit because uh, there was uh, in life sometimes uh, you you have to prior prioritize. So the prior and the priorities can keep changing. So that time, to be honest, uh, it wasn't it wasn't a good time. It just number one, Warrior FC was in in difficult position. Uh, in many ways, uh, in fact, years after me, uh, the club, uh, I think they are doing only, um, uh, it's no more playing in, uh, in S-League. And uh, also m myself, I wasn't uh, in the best, uh, in best situation. So I wouldn't uh, judge or comment on, on that because it was short. Though that time when I came back to Singapore, there was... Uh, uh, because I came back with a lot of success from India, there was even a uh, possibility and there is a big chance that I coached the Young Lions of, of Singapore. But Singapore football also is uh, have many positive things, which is uh, they are well structured. All the clubs have what it's needed in terms of the marketing, the infrastructure and everything. But uh, uh, in terms of funds, because it's a small pool of, uh, of, uh, of players, it's not large. It's, it's, you really need to work very, very hard to, to find talents and, and build strong assets or strong team. So okay, now we'll go a little bit into, your co into yourself as a coach. If you had to describe yourself as a coach, which description would best suit your team? You know, in, in just uh, just now, the, there is, uh, I don't know if I quit and I go to, to WhatsApp. Uh, if uh, Can I go to, to my WhatsApp? Will we stay? Uh, I think so. I think so. We'll yeah. stay. Because, because we just now in this webinar, yeah. I just finished, I just finished, uh, I finished uh, uh, the, the, it's a, it's a, co a coach mental, we call it. It's, okay. a, it's, a, it's a coach that, uh, that basically uh, talked to us about the psychology. And we did a test for our personalities. Okay. You know? And th there is six, uh, six, uh, six of them. There is the, the, the rebellion. There is the, uh, the guy who work hard. There is the guy who wants to be always organized and all that. So... I I I I I'm, I work hard, and I'm into details because I feel the details are the one who make the difference. And uh, I uh, 
uh, I'm open to to new ideas. All right, uh, and football is very simple. You know, football is very simple. I I know what is needed to not to win games, to win trophies. Because to win game, it's kind of easy. You can win two games, but then after you can. But if you want to be consistent, because to win a Fed Cup, you need to win five games on a row. To win a league, you need to to be unbeaten for almost 15 games. And so basically, to win something, you need to win a lot, draw very few, and lose very few. Uh, and the ingredients of that are. I always uh, simulate them to a table with four legs. The and you need the four legs because a table, if you break one leg, you can use it, right? The four legs are leg number one. You need to have very good players, technically quality. Leg number two, they have to be very fit to play high tempo game for 90 minutes or maybe more third leg you need to find you need to be tactically sound and strategically sound and it's not your strategy it's what is suited to the environment it changed you know the the strategy and tactics i was playing with in pune is not the same in salgokar is not the same in, in mohan Bagan. there are some assets but there are changes and the fourth which is the mental side, unity, solidarity. So if you may have three and not have one leg, you can win some games, but you will not win trophies. You know, I give an example. If you have the fitness, the tactical side and the uh, psychological side, but you have average players, average center back, you will play good. But the center back will do an individual mistake, which you will concede a goal and lose because you don't have good team in every position. You may have the best players. They're all very fit. They're all very organized and tactically sound. But there is no unity. They will be fighting on the field. They will be arguing. They will be so you will not you may win one game, but to win ten games on a row, like what we did in Mohan Bagan, ten wins on a row. You know, 10 games, 10 wins at Mohan Bagan. It's still a record in the I League. You need the four legs. And that's what I believe on and I work on every day. Uh, in my coaching personality, I'm very, I like to, I like, uh, to, to have humor and fun with the players. But uh, on the field, I'm completely different. Very serious, very demanding. In fact, most of the people who know me, the players who know me, they always say, uh, Karim the coach and Karim the man. And they are both different. Karim the coach is very, can be misunderstood by being strict or being hard or demanding. Uh, but when they know me better, it's actually only to push them every time to, to perform. And I think many of them, uh, uh, an example, Odafa, when I took him at Churchill Brothers, he was, I think, on $3,000 salary and he was uh, the, what is known about him is quality striker but a bit lazy so i was strict and i was pushing and i was no you have to train every day you have to and and the two season at churchill he was the top scorer and when i came to mon bagan he was the highest paid player in the league 40000 it's basically uh, i would not say that it's me but it's basically it just my job is to push the players and the team to get better and better and better. And in that process, in the process of pushing players, sometimes I get hard because I don't get what I'm expecting. Uh, but the, the final objective is only to get them better. And uh, when they get better, they are the first winners, even financially the first winners. So now we'll go to a little bit tactical. What is your go-to formation? Like when you go to a new team, what formation would you want to play there first for the team implement? My favorite formation? Yes. <coughs> I, uh, 
There is in in systems of play. Uh, I will talk about the formation and the style of play because they are different. The formation, as you know, there is you can play three at the back in three five two, three four three, in a different way. But basically, it's three that can be like three five two can be five three two, or five four one. Uh, I I don't use this formation a lot, uh, bec simply because. Uh, when you play three at the back, if you notice three, five, two, you have only two players on the flanks. And these two players are key for this formation. Because these two players, there is only one on the left and one on the right. Though there is movements of the other players, but the responsibility is very important for this player on the flanks. To When you have the ball, when you're attacking in the attacking third of the opposition, they have to be available very high on the pitch to give crosses, to assist, to even score goals. But when you are defending in your defensive third, they need to be like right back and left back of a 4 4 And that is very, very, very demanding. These two players are key of this system and they need to be super, super fit and they need to be good footballers. And I believe in uh, in in leagues like uh, like uh, you know unless you are on the top high level in in Europe like Italy they use it a lot because they have those uh, the the criteria of these two players are very available but like in India or even in Morocco it's not very much available to find good player who is super fit for 90 minutes up and down strong you have one player who Hakimi. Hakimi. Uh, Hakimi is a product of Real Madrid playing at the highest level in uh, in in Dortmund. Now you understand me very well. You proved me that you understand what I'm saying and you understand football. Uh, Dortmund played that system of a four three uh, four uh, three four three, and Hakimi is very very very. You see, he's defending as a right back, and he's attacking as a left half, scoring goals lot of assists uh, but uh, you agree with me that in in countries and in leagues of a certain level it's not it's very difficult to find that profile of player so that's why i don't use it a lot otherwise uh four at the back four three three four four diamond system with one number 10 and two strikers uh, depend on the opposition for example, if the opposition is weak in the center, that means they have uh, uh, average defensive midfield and an average one of the center backs is a bit average. So I play 4-4-2 diamond with the uh, one attacking midfield and two strikers to attack mainly from the center. Uh, if I want to play more on the flanks, maybe a 4-3-3 or even a 4-2-3-1. Uh, but in all those formations, uh, I like the right and side and the left back to be very attacking. I like them to overlap. In fact, a lot of uh, automatism, and a, lo a lot of uh, uh, work that we do on the field, they involve them to be overlapping. Uh, it's just at the difference of three at the back, what I just talked now, in a 4-4-2, the right back can overlap uh, maybe uh, two, three times, and because he's tired, maybe another action, he will not move up high. He can stay because there is already, you have already right half who can do it. It's better with him added to the to the attack, but even if you don't attack, you still balance, you're still okay. Um, and um, I'm quite proud with, the, with this style. I like to, uh, my team was always very fit, very aggressive, uh, high pressure on the, on the ball. We like to disturb uh, opponent uh, players in every part of the field. Um, I teach them to be united. That means we don't. Uh, one is uh, is pushing the pressure. Uh, let's say the right back is uh, or, or uh, right half is putting pressure on right back, and then the others would say no. It's his job. If if the one of the central midfield. And one of the striker is closer to the to that 
player who have the ball, I like them to join the pressure, to be even two, three versus one. Sometimes the one of the center back, for example, of the opposition, my center back will put pressure face, and he but he cannot see behind. I I want my striker if he's close by, if he's at three, four meters, to join the pressure from from behind. And usually you force that player to lose the ball. So everybody is concerned in uh, defending and everybody is concerned attacking. In fact, I always say my first striker is the goalkeeper because I don't want him to just kick the ball. I want him to get involved in the build-up. And my first defender is the striker. Uh, but of course, here many times people misunderstand it because I want my strikers to defend but I always ask them, the percentage is not the same. You know, my centre-back will defend. I want him to invo be involved in the attack, but his job first is defending. So he will defend 70% and attack 30%. Striker will defend 30% and attack uh, 70%. Because when you do counters, when you, do, when you attack, you need your strikers to be also fresh to, to make a difference in their dribbling, in their... Uh, uh, in their when they attack a cross or something. We can have another maybe one hour episode only on tactics with Mr. Karim. So our listeners can say us if you want that or not. So we'll move on to our next question, okay? So this is just my personal question I ask all the coaches. I don't know why, but I like asking them this question. Which one do you prefer, man marking or zonal marking? Um... Well, in the game, in the game, yes, it's always it's always zone and marking, always. In but you game. require quality of players for that, like yeah, of uh, course. I mean, you work you work on that. I do sometimes, r rarely when I do uh, uh, individual ma uh, man marking. Uh, usually, not in the defense. For example, if there is a strong striker, I ask the defensive midfield. Uh, and uh, even the, uh, for example, if he's playing always on the, on one of my centre backs, I ask the the defensive midfield, and the other centre back and the right back, to be whenever he's involved to be close to cover or to join the, the the pressure on him, even from the from number six from the defensive midfield. But sometimes, usually, you find. A player who make the game, you know, very, very, very influential in in making the game for for that team. He play usually. He will be maybe uh, most of the time he will be one of the center midfielder, maybe number eight or number ten. If I find that he have a big, big impact on the game, I do uh, I do uh, work on the team. So I prepare them like we are playing with 10 players, okay? Because one of my players will be everywhere with that player, okay? Uh, sometimes I, I ask that man marking only when that player comes to our half of the field. Sometimes even when he's in his half of the field. Uh, like I remember one of the international games that recently, last year we played uh, with, with Morocco. I noticed that the opposition had uh, the one of the centre backs. They have two centre backs. The key players was one of the centre backs, and the holding midfielders was had a big impact. Every single attack start with them, so the centre back was very comfortable, technically sound, carry the ball forward, and he always looked for this number six, the the holding midfield and. From there, all the damage is done. Uh, when we played here in Morocco, we uh, we we suffered because I didn't I didn't know. But when we played away, we played even better. Uh, um, uh, when we played away game, I ask the centre back, the my forward, to not keep running between the when we lose the ball, to when the ball is out, for example, for a goal kick. I, I'm not asking him to, to be in the middle and press both centre-backs. I say, forget the weak centre-back. When we lose the ball, go and man-mark that strong centre-back who is doing our damage. 
And one of my midfielders, as soon as we lose the ball, my number 10, to as soon as we lose the ball, to go to the holding midfield. So when a man marked these two, uh, the game changed. They could not find that uh, uh, that uh, usual game that they have, that usual, we call it uh, circuit préférentiel. That means they prefer to go always through that number four and not number six. All the attacks are over. Number six, he give diagonal balls. He can give through a ball behind the line of the defense. He can give the, the find the, uh, a cut pass, uh, a true pass with, to, to beat the whole midfield with just one pass. So when we block them, they couldn't make their game. And we we do, we played, we dominate that game in, uh, in fact, the first uh, 12 minutes we hit the post once and we create three clear chances. So basically, the, 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 uh, it's like this, but mainly zonal marking. In terms of set pieces, especially corners, uh, it's a mixed defense. So I like to put uh, one who is zonal, one on the first post, one on the first post area, and one on the back post area. These guys are zonal, uh, and one on the D, and the rest will be man marking for each player. So we'll quickly wrap up because I've taken so much of your time. I'll ask a few no questions problem. first. So do you have any coach or coaches from whom you are inspired? Um, I like good football. I like attacking football. So if, uh, as I said, if you take only India, all the teams that I have coached are known to score a lot of goals. And even my last team, Pune FC, was a young team. And the strongest team that time was uh, Bangalore FC, okay, with the, I think the coach, uh, Ashley Westwood was the coach, yeah. and that was a strong team that time, it was the best team uh, in terms of quality of the players, and uh, I think second, uh, we played the uh, away game, we played in Bangalore with their fans, and we had 1-3-1 one, uh, one, uh, in Bangalore. Uh, we had won that season, we had won uh, La Jong in our home ground 5-2. Oh. So we was always a team that scored a lot of goals. The top scorers was most of the time with, with my team. Okay, because uh, uh, like with Churchill, uh, first season was Odafa, the top scorer of the league. Uh, the second season was Odafa and Mboyo. My two strikers was the top scorer and second top scorer. Uh, so everywhere I, I have coached, I encourage the attack in football. Uh, but I'm not also, uh, I like to play uh, attack in football, good football, but pragmatic as well. So I'm not, uh, uh, how to say, if I compare myself and the current football situation, I see myself more close to Klopp of Liverpool than to Guardiola of Manchester City. I'm not... Uh, uh, I like to keep possession, but if I can go and score quick goals and counter, uh, I do it. Uh, and possession is only when everything is blocked and we have to be patient. While, for example, if you watch Guardiola, the first thing to win the ball is first to keep possession and to play possession. And they then have some six the second rule or something, right? Where they when they lose the position, they within six seconds they try to get the position. Yeah, exactly. So, so that's the, the defensive part, but I'm talking when they have the ball. Okay. Uh, but of course, when they lose the ball, they want to, uh, because it's true, that's the best, uh, the best time to, because six, why six seconds is because the other team is still, because the other team is, is when you defend, you close, you're out, you don't open up the field. Uh, and when you win the ball, you, you open up. So before the players, of the opposition getting to uh, open up the field and find it difficult. They want to win it before they they, they, they organize in attacking. Uh, so that's my uh, my take on that. Okay, so do you have any words for players or coaches who are just starting out their careers? Well, uh, first the advice is that the, the game of football is very, very, very difficult. Very difficult for a player and double, triple difficult for a coach. Uh, in fact, what holds you in this job 
is uh, as a player as well is the passion because we love the game but actually if you if you do it my advice if you're gonna do a coach or a player just with the dream to make money don't do it because it's gonna be tough but at a certain time you're gonna give up but if you do it as a passion go all out go for it because it's a great job but it comes with a lot of uh, of challenges uh, the, the, the for example as a coach you you are uh, I, I just uh, compare a banker and a coach to, to understand me a banker when he join a bank uh, an organization he will have time to settle he will be judged in two years maybe how is his performance uh, what was his role in the bank a coach is judged every game every single game, which means if sometimes every three days and latest, latest every week, and it can change drastically. You can be the hero uh, in the month of January because you won three games in a row. You would be sacked in February because you lost three games in a row. Uh, it can change drastically. So you have to be resilient. You have to love what you do. And of course, you have to, to work hard. I mean, to uh, even as a football player now, uh, to be successful as a player, you need to, that's why I always say that uh, I talk about it at the start, coaches, we need to educate the players and the players have to educate themselves uh, because when they know what they, what to expect from them, it's easier. So they have to, they have to, um, in my opinion, in their free time, they have to get interested into the diet. They have to get interested into the law of the game. They have to get interested because they are professionals. So they have to master all these things that are uh, that make their job, you know. And uh, for a player, his uh, his asset is his body, you know. And football is not a game who who is easy. It's a game basically. In fact, uh, the sports of football gave hard time to your body twisting knees, twisting ankles, to dribble. Just imagine an action where you're going to 100% speed, uh, uh, tackle, win the ball, and uh, uh, again, carry the ball with speed and and uh, uh, cut, make a cutback uh, for the opponent. Look at just these actions that I told you. Just imagine the ball sliding against the grass with your skin, with your... Uh, imagine the, how the how the ankle is behaving, how the knee, the the strength and the the pressure that is on those uh, on, on the muscle. So, uh, uh, how to balance it for a player is basically to what need to do so your body can support all this. What is the demand of football? How is basically to go to the gym work on your proprioceptivity, strengthen your upper body. Uh, uh, ben Atia was, uh, was our captain of the national team and ex-player of Juventus. He said recently in one of his lives, he said uh, they played uh, an away game in Italy. Uh, the game finished. Uh, they are on the way back home to Torino. And... Uh, it was evening, it was around uh, 8 in the evening or something. And then uh, he, uh, he's sitting a bit up front and Ronaldo is sitting at the back a bit of the bus. So he received a message from Ronaldo. Uh, what are you going to do when you reach? Uh, Benatia said, uh, I'm going home. He said, uh, do you want to join me in the gym? They finished the game because he explained he said he never seen any workaholic like Ronaldo. The day of the game, he finished the game, he go and work all the muscles that wasn't involved in the game. Because when you play a game, you, you, the, the leg muscles are involved, uh, the, the calf muscle is involved, uh, but like your upper body is not involved. So his objective immediately after the game he have everything at home, but sometimes he go to the club. First, he will go and continue the workout of the upper body. And then he will go to recovery. 
He will go for uh, sauna, for uh, jacuzzi, for all what is needed to get back his... And then he will go eat what is necessary for his body to, to recover. So that is what is a professional footballer. And people look at this, uh, at Ronaldo at every game. Wow, he scored a lot. Wow, he's 35 and still... There is something behind that. Why he doesn't get injured a lot. Why he is still surviving at 35 as being the best. Uh, I had the chance. Morocco was a good country of uh, track and field. Uh, like we had Awita, we had Hisham El Garouj. These are athletes, for example, 1,500 rocker, 300, uh, three, three minutes something. I had the chance to watch these guys, Subashish. Uh, and uh, people see them because when we watch Olympics, we see that 1,500 meter is run in three minutes something. And then we read that he beat the rocker and because he beat the rocker, he got $500,000 for the rocker. And for Olympic champion, he gets another $300,000. And we all say, wow, in three minutes, he won all this money. But to make that rocker, he had two, three years of mm -hmm. suffering. Uh, truck and field is the most difficult training so i had seen for example awita uh, he will do uh, they have a program of series though he run 1500 but to work on his resistance he have to do for example uh, today he will work on his resistance he will do 10 times 400 meter in a certain time with the timing with the coach which is very very high tempo and you have to do uh, seven times 100 meter or 60 meter to work on his finishing. So when he started the, 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 his training after warm up and all that, in about 60, 70 percent of the session. Now, for, for example, he's on the eighth series of 400 meter. When he reach, he still have two. When he reach, his body, he start, uh, he reach and he go on the side because he's vomiting. So basically, the body is asking the athlete, I can't take it anymore. I'm done. But he will go vomit, he will drink some water, and he will attack the, the ninth series, the tenth series, and sometimes even after the ninth series, when he reach, he go again. There is nothing to vomit, but he go again, and, and uh, his body is suffering. That's how they get those records. And uh, and people have to understand that. And footballers have to understand that they need to work hard to achieve higher results. So I'll ask you one final question. It's a very controversial question. So get ready. Which one do you prefer, Lionel Messi or Cristiano Ronaldo? <laughs> well, to be honest, um, I will give you my answer, but it's uh, don't... From the answer, I'm not a fan of this one rather than this one. I'm, I'm going to be very objective. Uh, le, le, I would say, I would give an advantage to Ronaldo. Again, it's not I'm a fan of uh, Real Madrid or Juventus of Ronaldo. I like good football. I'm not a fan of any team. I'm, I always say that I'm a fan of the team that I'm coaching right now. Uh, why Ronaldo? Number one is uh, I find Ronaldo a complete athlete before being a footballer. So Ronaldo can score with both feet, can score with the head, uh, can uh, uh, can dribble. Uh, Messi is above Ronaldo in the dribbling ability, in the in the creating uh, something out of nothing. Yes. But Ronaldo is another level. He can uh, he can play uh, uh, as a striker. He can play behind striker. He can score with the head. We had seen some headers that he's like flying, you know, and stay on the air uh, uh, and then head the ball while the defender already came down. He, this is one why I give him slight advantage. The second reason why I give him slight advantage, I feel Messi. Uh, was in a comfort zone, basically. Barcelona, all the way uh, from the 
La Masia from the youth level to the top level. And in fact, uh, uh, many years, the team is not, uh, Barcelona doesn't make the team. Barcelona make the team that suit Messi. And anyone who, who will disturb Messi in any way, in the game, in the style, will be out and will bring somebody that will suit his style and everything. So for years now, Barcelona is doing everything to keep Messi comfortable. So basically, Messi, for all those years, he was in a comfort zone. Of course, he gave a lot to Barcelona. He made them win many trophies. But, but he's in a comfort zone, not challenge at all. He only challenged himself by his quality. Ronaldo, on the other hand, uh, and, and Messi, if you get him, the only time when he gets out of that comfort zone, when he go to Argentina and Argentina. And we see that it's different Messi. You know, we are a little bit disappointed that Messi didn't won a World Cup with the, with the Argentina. Also. While Ronaldo, on the other hand, he challenged himself. I don't think he liked to be in a comfort zone. He was in a comfort zone in, in Manchester. He became the star of Manchester. He scored an amazing goal. He decided to go to Real Madrid. He started again. He built a name there. He made it happen. He won three Champions League on a row. Uh, and some of them he won it just by himself, scoring important goals in difficult time. And uh, he, was, he became in a comfort zone. He can do anything in Real Madrid. But he decided to go, OK, in a more difficult league also, in terms of a striker with the marking, with the defensive side, Juventus, OK? He wasn't in comfort zone. So he made an impact in Juventus. You take him out and you put him in Portugal. He made an impact. He won the Euro, at least. So I analyze for you why I give slight advantage to Ronaldo. It's because, not because of the, again, it's not the heart who is talking. I'm not a fan of it. But I'm just giving you, uh, I'm doing it nicely because I think you are a fan of Messi. No, no, I'm not a fan of anyone <laughs> as such. I like both of them. It's understand, like, understand. It's, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm a fan of. of and I, mean, and I hope, and I hope that uh, the fans of Messi uh, should not be disappointed with me. Is I'm, I'm just giving. I give why. You know, I mean, in terms of pure uh, football, maybe Messi have more genius in him. But if I talk about the whole thing. Uh, I give Ronaldo a bit of edge because of uh, of the what I just explained uh, before. So, Mr. Karim, thank you so much for talking to us, and we wish you all the best for your future campaigns. Which we wish you win all the possible trophies, maybe everything, whatever is available, and hope we can talk again soon. Thank you so much for coming on the show. Most welcome, and I uh, I take this opportunity to to thank uh, your radio and. Uh, all the Nepal uh, fans of, uh, of football, I have been there with Mohan Bagan and I know that they are also crazy about the game. And from, uh, I take the opportunity as well to salute and uh, all the, the, the fans of, uh, of football in India, because I know they listen to your show. And uh, uh, special uh, thanks to, to Mohan Bagan fans and, and Calcutta fans in general. Thank you so much. You must welcome. Bye-bye.